All right, so in our time of greeting this morning, you turned, uh, and I have to say, I, I probably had heard more conversation and greeting this morning over sharing your movies than I, than I hear just about any other Sunday morning, so I'm, I'm assuming there was some good sharing that, that happened there. Who would like to tell me, uh, if you'd be willing, what movie you said was an impactful one for you as you turned and talked to people around you? Yeah. Foxtrot? An Israeli movie about the futility of war called Foxtrot. You guys can write these down if you want. Okay. Uh, documentary? No? Okay. Yeah. What else? Foxtrot. That's good. Yeah. Here. Mm. Yep, story about a lion, story about a boy who gets lost in India and, and is raised in Australia and finally finds his way back home. A lot of, lot of metaphors and beautiful, yeah. Yeah. Battle of the Sexes, story of Billie Jean King and, and the things that she advanced in terms of women's rights in, in, the, in the tennis world. Yeah. <laughs> RBG, somebody saw RBG. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I've heard about it, haven't seen it, but yeah, pretty, pretty moving, I guess. Yeah, who else? RBG? Yeah. Okay, you know, here's, this is so funny. When I told people, hey, we're going to do a series on, on movies and cinema, like, are you kidding? Like, what? It's, I have never seen Presbyterians stand in the sanctuary and call out <laughs> like that, uh, but here we are talking about movies, and all of a sudden, over here, talk to me, I got one for you, RBG, <laughs> hallelujah. I mean, this is spiritual stuff, guys. Don't tell me that movies aren't spiritual stuff. All right. Can I get a couple more? Yeah. Darkest Hour. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that from a few different people. A um, couple more over here. Doug, we'll go with you first. Hidden Figures. Jeez Louise, that was, if you didn't see Hidden Figures, that's a powerful one about the, the women, African-American women who were kind of behind the whole race to the moon. And Yeah. Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Tough one, but good one. Excellent, excellent movie. Um, yeah, we got, well, we got, we got, I guess we got to keep going. Yeah, uh-huh. A moment of truth. About bullfighting. Yeah. Yeah, so looking at a barbaric practice like bullfighting and trying to understand historically how we can rectify that with things today that, that we see as barbaric. That's good, that's good. Yes, Courtney. Life is beautiful, man, oh man, that one. Yeah, that's good. What was it? To Kill a Mockingbird, yeah, oldie but a goodie. Was that yours, Kate? What? Beirut? Yeah. The glory of Beirut uh, in, its, in its glory days. All right, I go, we, keep, we got one more. This is it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ghostbusters, a female cast. Girls got to see women as heroes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So here's the thing. It, it can feel a little bit naughty or a little bit, oh, we're kind of off script. We shouldn't be doing this, talking about movies in church because... What we can do is we can think that what happens in a cinema house or what happens in theater, what we do on the weekends or whatever, it, it, that's, that's nice, but it's kind of distracting. It's a, it's, they're distractions. That's what they're supposed to be. They're amusement, right? And, and amusement, the word literally means a, which is mean without, and to muse, which means to think. So amusement is without thinking. You don't think. You just go to these things. You're distracted. And, and that's nice and everything. We can enjoy it. But you go to church... And, you, you know, it's serious stuff. You're here to think serious thoughts and to engage with God and each other in very intentional, worshipful ways. And so this idea that you could be in a place like church with stained glass windows and, and high ceilings and you could sit in rows like this and talk in hushed voices, what does that have to do with a place where you go and you sit in room, rows with high ceilings and you talk in hushed voices? And Wait a minute. Maybe these two worlds that we tend to kind of separate in our minds and in society, 
maybe they're not meant to be separated. I hope that in the course of this sermon series, we hear from all of you, and by the way, I've been emailing and Alex has been emailing out to all of you saying, please send me the movies that have really moved you or changed you, impacted you. I'm going to try to remember all these and I'm going to add them. But a few of you have, but I've only gotten about 20 or so. I would love to hear from more of you because I want to put together a list at the end of the summer, kind of like we did last year with our, with our summer um, playlist of the songs that really impacted you. It's just powerful stuff. And I hope that each one of us will be impacted and challenged by the truths, the understanding, the questions, uh, the, the emotions that are raised in these movies. But as importantly as learning from them, what I hope that we do as a course of this series is that we intentionally deconstruct that barrier that we put into our lives and our hearts, our souls, as to where you can worship and where you can't. But where holy things happen and where they don't. Because I don't, and I don't say that just to be provocative, I say that because it's biblical. And I think that we continue to maintain those barriers as to what is thoughtful or what is not thoughtful, what is true worship and what is distraction. We continue to maintain those barriers at our own peril as a church. And shame on us if we can't understand how clear the Bible is in saying that God is at work everywhere and in all things. God does not have a sacred and a secular understanding in God's mind. There is no true difference in God's mind between the theater where we sit in rows and eat popcorn and the place where we sit in rows and listen to somebody on a Sunday morning. God is equally at work in both places. And and I believe that because that's what the Bible says. And I believe that if we really want to be better Christians, if we really want to be more uh, complete and and full in our worship of God, we have got to continue to deconstruct those divisions in our lives so that we can recognize, celebrate, and worship God in all the ways that God is at work in the world. God is a lot bigger, a lot more creative, a a, a lot more involved in the everyday thoughts and feelings and wonders and questions that are happening, not just here in this space, but in spaces all throughout our city, whether it be a Pilates class or a coffee shop or a movie theater, God is at work. And for us to open our eyes to that, to validate that, to celebrate that, and then to add our voice to that conversation is paramount to the continuation and the growth of the church and our understanding of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. So I hope this is something that each one of us learn in this process. And and I want us to start by reading... uh, and I know I say this a lot. I'm a, I like the Bible. What can I say? Um, but this is one of my favorite Bible passages um, of all. And it is found in um, Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. So Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. If you could find a Bible and open to it, we're going to read this carefully. So I really would love for you to have a Bible in front of you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. I'll give you a little bit of context. This is the Apostle Paul in Athens. Paul has been uh, on his second missionary journey. He was with uh, Timothy and Silas. And they were uh, in the northern part of of Greece in their second uh, journey in Thessalonica. Um, And uh, and they ran into some troubles there. They got into a lot of trouble, in fact, and they, they were feared for Paul's life. And so Paul actually escaped from Thessalonica. He left the two of them there, Silas and Timothy, and then he made his way down uh, to Athens. And as he um, entered Athens, as far as we know, this was the first time Paul had ever been to Athens. Paul was a Jewish boy who had grown up in Tarsus and had made his way down to Jerusalem. As far as we know, he'd only kind of been in that area of what would be today kind of Israel. And he made his way to Athens for the first time. Athens, as we know, capital of of Greece, but it was really the cultural, intellectual, really spiritual capital of the Roman Empire at this time. And so as Paul is walking through Athens, picture this majestic city with this this kind of Jewish, well-learned Jewish country boy who, who, who walks in, and as a good Jew, Paul is troubled and distressed, because as soon as he walks into Athens, he sees temples, and he sees statues, and he sees plaques that are all dedicated to all these different gods. And as a good Jew, you know there's only one God, 
and, and you don't have these idols, you don't do these things. So as it, when Paul starts walking through the streets of Athens, he's distressed. But then I would like to believe that there is a transformation that takes place in the heart and the life of Paul as he continues to evolve as the one who has been called by the resurrected Christ to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Paul leaves Jerusalem behind, leaves Antioch behind. He's called out into the world to share the good news of Jesus with the Gentiles, with the heathen. And I believe as he continues on that adventure, God continues to reveal new things to him about the breadth and, and the depth and the beauty of God in the world. And so as Paul is walking through Athens, he is distressed until, uh, and, he, and he begins by talking to people in the synagogue, and then he, he kind of goes beyond that and begins to talk to people in the Agora, in the marketplace, and some philosophers from some Greek philosophers who are probably a lot smarter than Paul engage him in conversation and kind of basically ask him to come back to their book club and talk more about what he's talking about. Um, so as we read through this, I want you to answer some questions. In your bulletin, where it shows what the scripture reading is for today, I have put four or five bullets. So in your bulletin, there are four or five bullets, some questions. Can you look at those real quick? Because as I read the passage, I want you to answer these questions. Got him? Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. While Paul waited for them, Silas and Timothy, in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began first to interact with the Jews and the Gentile God worshipers in the synagogue. Then he also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. So he's just kind of going out there talking to people. Now, certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion too. Okay? Who, who engaged discussion? Some said, what an amateur. <laughs> these were brilliant. These are probably some of the most brilliant people in the Western world at that time. We always think that Paul was smart, but I mean, these guys are like, oh, really? Interesting. Hmm. What an amateur. But... You know, he's babbling, but what's he trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. So, my CEB says they took him into custody. I don't like that translation. Basically, he wasn't arrested. They just took him with them. They're like, oh, you're coming with us. So they took him with him and brought him to the council that met on Mars Hill, or the Areopagus. Um, so Paul, and, and, and that place that you see down below would be kind of what the Areopagus was. It was an outcropping, a rock outcropping, where people would gather, and it used to be a court of law where um, they would sit and hear cases, but it became more and more kind of an open marketplace where people could gather and share discussions and ideas. Um, and so that's where they take Paul, and he gathers there on Mars Hill in the Areopagus, and they say, we want to we wanna hear more about what you're talking about, Okay. So they took him and brought him to the council of Mars Hill, or the Areopagus, and they said, what is this new teaching? Can we learn what you are talking about? You've told us some very strange things, and we want to know what they mean. Now, here's a parenthetical put in there by Luke, who wrote this. He says, now, they said this because Athenians, as well as any foreigner who live in Athens, used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. <laughs> Does it sound like any culture that you know today? Yeah. <clears throat> now, Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill, and he said, people of Athens, and I really believe there's a shift here in Paul, people of Athens, I see, I see that you are, a very, you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life and breath and everything else. From one person, God created every nation to live throughout the earth having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their lands god made the nations so that they would seek him perhaps even reach out to him and find him in fact 
God isn't far away from any of us. In God we live and move and exist. In God we live and move and have our being. As some of your own pop prophets or poets have said, we are his offspring. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. There is so much there. But just, just thinking about, and I don't know if I have my bulletin here, the, well, I do. The first question, when Paul reaches out with the gospel, who engages with him? Who engages with Paul as he reaches out? The philosophers, right? So the Epicureans and the Stoics, they kind of approach him, and they're like, hey, we want to hear more about this, okay. Um, and what do they think about Paul and his teaching? Eh, not quite. You're, maybe are you a babbler, but are, are they abusive towards him? Are they dismissive? No. Hey, come on. We want to we wanna hear more about this. We want to talk. Come, come to our small group. Come to our book study. They're interested. Paul makes it pretty clear. Where does God not live? Yeah, in temples built by stone. All right, so God does not live in those places. Where then can God be found? Everywhere. Everywhere. As we read in the psalm in the beginning, it, it doesn't matter if you're on the far side of the sea or if you're in the depths of hell. It doesn't matter. God is every. You can't get away from God. And God creates us in such a way that we, we are all looking to just kind of reach out and find God in various ways. And guess what? God is very close to each one of us. So as we reach out to find God, we will find God. Th that's how God has made us. And, and it's interesting, you know, when we talk about the apostle Paul, we, we, we think about him in his um, kind of the, the, the major experience of his journey was when he was a persecutor of the early Christians and he was on his way to Damascus to um, arrest people who were following Jesus because he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a very strong, strict Jew. And on his way to Damascus, he has an epiphany, right? Jesus appears to him, the resurrected Christ, and says, Paul, what are you doing? Um, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am calling you now to go be the apostle to the Gentiles. And so Paul has this amazing epiphany. His whole life changes on the road to Damascus. I think that Paul has another epiphany, a major life-changing event in his heart, soul, and mind on his road to the Areopagus, on his road to Mars Hill as he walks through Athens, this magnificent and glorious and disturbing city. Paul understands that there is one God, and yet he sees these people worshiping many gods, so he's disturbed, but as he continues along and is engaged by these Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, he can't deny the fact that they're brilliant, that they've got good questions, that they're the ones who engaged him in conversation, they brought him to their book study. Okay, there must be more to these people. They're not just heathens who need to repent and I need to show them the true way. And as he makes his journey to Mars Hill, as he makes his journey to the, the meeting at the Areopagus, Paul recognizes, yeah, there are these pillars and there are these temples and there are these statues and there are these plaques, but rather than condemn this stuff and rather than see this as a sign of this heathen culture, maybe something's going on here. Maybe these people really are reaching out to God in the way that they know and maybe God is reaching back. Maybe, as I have learned, God is not the God of one nation, but of all nations. Maybe instead of focusing on being disturbed, I should focus instead on trying to actively see and recognize what God is doing in this place. Perhaps I can go from myself not knowing God as well as I should to knowing God more fully and helping these people to worship the one that they call the unknown God and put a name to that God. And Paul even moves from quoting Moses to quoting Greek poets. Many Christians today are um, concerned. And any time there's another mass tragedy in our country, it seems like you hear a chorus of Christians saying, oh, this is what we are reaping. When people aren't going to church anymore, when, when we're not allowing prayer in schools anymore, we have distanced ourselves from God, and so this is the punishment that we get. 
And friends, I, I don't just think that that's not true. I, I think that that is a distortion of the gospel. You see, I think that God is not, as some Christians are, I don't think God is wringing her hands, worrying that somehow the world is going to pot because we've taken the Ten Commandments off the walls of certain buildings in certain places. I don't think that's the kind of God that we have. I don't think that's the kind of God that we worship. I don't think that's the kind of God that is explained to us and depicted to us through the words of Scripture. The God that I know and the God that I feel that we worship is a God that is everywhere and in all things. And our God is not falling back and tisking and tisking and punishing cultures. Our God is moving forward. Our God is at work in people's lives. Our God is drawing people unto themselves. Our God has created us so that in each one of us, there is a void, there is a God-shaped void within each one of us that calls out to, that looks for higher meaning and purpose and mystery in life. God's put that in each one of us, and God is at work in everybody's life speaking to them in creative ways, in nuanced ways, in ways that we in the church community might not call religious. But that doesn't mean God's not at work. And that's why sometimes the people that need to be converted in this world are the Christians. So that we can actually see that our living God is at work in the world, changing people's lives, challenging them to ask questions, meeting them in the midst of their darkness. And rather than condemning it or being distressed by saying these are pagans or these aren't the right gods or whatever, we could instead have our eyes opened as Paul's were and say, what do you know? In him we live and we move and we have our being. God's not far from any one of us. And rather than be dismissive or be condemning, perhaps we should be listening and engaging and adding our voices to the conversations that are already happening. We wonder, we worry why people aren't going to church. Friends, people are going to church. It might not be here, but they're finding that small group. They're finding that Pilates studio. They're finding that cafe. They're finding that Whole Foods. They're finding a place where they can connect with other people and strive to grow in more of a healthy and, 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 and moral and, and meaningful relationship with others and a God that they might not know the name of. Friends, people are going to church. And sometimes it's us churchgoers who are the ones that need to be converted to open our eyes to see what God is doing, the magical, beautiful things that God is doing in the world so that we can worship more fully and worship with them and perhaps even bring a name, bring our understanding of the conversation, bring a name to that God into those lives. I get fired up about this stuff. I'm, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a, a quote from Martin Scorsese, who was raised in Brooklyn in a very strong Catholic family. And as a young boy, Scorsese uh, thought he was going to be a priest. And he was kind of heading towards the priesthood, went to a Catholic school. And, and then he had a conversion. My daughter, who's at UCLA School of Film and Television, said um, that he actually did become a priest, just a different kind of priest, a much more effective priest. Scorsese says, thinking about the first time that he walked into a movie theater with his parents, and I would encourage each one of you to think about this. Think about the first time you walked into a movie theater as a child, as a young adult, as a kid, whatever. Scorsese says this, the first sensation that I had was that that I was entering a magical world. It was the soft carpet, the smell of fresh popcorn, the darkness, the sense of safety, and above it all, a sense of sanctuary, much in my mind the same as entering into a cathedral. This, I knew, was a place of dreams, a place that excited and stretched my imagination. For Scorsese, the cinema was the cathedral of the 21st century, and he was going to be a high priest in delivering the gospel. It's interesting, right? I mean, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but it's not that big of a stretch. When you think about the high ceilings, the images on the wall, at church we have bread and wine, and in the theater you have popcorn and Coke. Rather than an offering plate being passed, 
They will reach out to you and see if you want to give to a certain charity, or you'll just go ahead and give way too much money for a bag of M&Ms or whatever the ticket price was. So we pay, right? We all sit in rows, we face forward, we speak in hushed voices, and we know sort of in a liturgical sense when we're supposed to stand, stand, when we're supposed to sit, when it's okay to clap, when it's okay to call out in response. Last weekend for my birthday, um, my wife Stacy took me and our kids on a trip to St. Louis. It was a great trip, and one of the things we did is we stopped. It was a Sunday morning. We stopped at the Basilica. Have you guys ever been to the Basilica in, in St. Louis? It's an it's astounding, beautiful building. Um, and in that cathedral, we walked up the steps, and we walked just into the narthex, and mass was happening. And, and, uh, and just even in the narthex, just the, the gold-tiled ceiling that was kind of arched and and the, they had a beautiful speaker system because there were speakers in there and the cantor who was singing as part of the mass, this beautiful baritone voice that was kind of echoing off the walls. It was just, I mean, as soon as you walked in the door, you were caught up and then you, you looked down the aisle and we didn't want to go in because mass was happening. But just the soaring ceilings and, and, the, and the, the images on the wall and the images of heaven and of the saints and, and then up the front where the... Where the, uh, where the you know, the chancel was, you had the officiants or the celebrants in their beautiful, just decked out gowns and singing in the choir, which I'm, I'm assuming, you know, it was like a 20 voice, 30 voice choir, and I'm guessing 20 of them were paid, were just singing beautiful songs, and I just thought, my gosh, this is incredible. This is amazing. This is beautiful. This is magical. This, friends, is good theater. Really good theater. Until not that long ago, when people came into the Mass, they didn't understand the word that was spoken. Why? Because it was spoken in Latin. And so you came in and you just allowed yourself to be overwhelmed with the size and the grandeur. You looked at the, at the stories that were told in the stained glass window. You listened to the, to the sounds bounce off the walls. You listened to the, to the choir and you, found, you imagined yourself in heaven. You imagined yourself being a part of something that's bigger than who you are. You imagine the mystery of life all of a sudden it's taking shape in this bread and this wine. And all of a sudden there was meaning all of us, each one of us, no matter where we come from, no matter what our background, we are searching for a deeper story, a deeper meaning, a mystery, metaphors that are put into place that make sense of our lives that we can be a part of. That's our human longing. And then I thought, I wonder what the budget is for this place. I mean, it was just... I mean, we cannot, we cannot continue to create spaces like that. And if we do, no one's going to them. Where they do go is they go to the movie theater with the high ceilings and the hushed voices and the stories that are told in powerful ways. Is God at work in both places? Yes, I think so. Does the church need to be converted so we can recognize what the Spirit of Christ is doing in the world in new and dynamic ways? Absolutely. George Miller is a Hollywood producer uh, who made... A lot of movies, um, ones that you might remember or, or know are Babe and The Witches of Eastwick. And he was a religious person growing up, but then um, he, put, he put it like this. I thought his quote was good. He said, I, I believe cinema is now the most powerful secular religion. People gather in cinemas to experience things collectively in a way they once did in church. The cinema storytellers have become the new priests. So why, what happened in our religious world for this to happen. He says, religious institutions concretized the metaphors and took much of the poetry, mystery, and mysticism out of the religious beliefs so that people went to other places to question their spirituality. Movies now do the work of our religious institutions. And we as Americans worship there often, uh, as far as I could tell. Um, people watch a lot of movies at home and on their tablets and on Netflix and such, but the average American goes out to the movie theater 25 times a year. Average American goes out to the theater 25 times a year, which averages out to about twice a month. And some of us on here are thinking, wow, that's a lot. And some of us are thinking, oh, geez, I go a lot more than that. <laughs> so it averages out to about twice a month that we go to the theater, go out and have that experience. In America, uh, on an average Sunday, we know now that roughly about 15 to 18% of Americans are going to a place of worship. I think it's like 98% of Americans will go to a movie um, 
over the course of a year. So we all pretty much go to movies. 18% of us worship on any given Sunday in, in, a, in a place like this. Um, it used to be in my world that if you were trying to recognize people that were regular churchgoers, you would say anybody who goes to church two or three times a month is a regular churchgoer. Today, we say it's once a month. <laughs> if you go once a month, you are registered as a regular churchgoer. And so, and if you go to church once a month and the service goes longer than an hour and 15 minutes, argh, right? <laughs> argh, I got things to do, argh, worship. Argh. But we'll go to two movies a month for two hours and pay way too much for our M&Ms and love it. Why? Because we want to be a part of a bigger story. We want to be a part of something that not just intellectually, but sensually and emotionally draws us into a bigger story, helps us to ask those deeper questions. Friends, some of the, the most profound conversations, if we're honest, that we have come after watching a movie with somebody on the ride home or, or coffee afterwards. I mean, some of the most powerful conversations, spiritual, intellectual, emotional conversations I've had with my family and some of my friends were after we watched La La Land or we watched Call Me By Your Name or any other movies that you guys have, have mentioned and you sit afterwards and you kind of unpack all that that did and all that that said and all that that meant to you. Some of the most powerful, profound, theological conversations I've had have come after a wonderful story is told and emotions are pulled and intellection is challenged in the movie theater. Friends, it is the cathedral of the 20th and 21st century, and that's not something to be worried about. That's something to recognize and to celebrate and to come alongside of. It's interesting that um, at the end of Paul's speech at Mars Hill in the Areopagus, he does a couple of things. He... Uh, he ends by saying this. He says, God made the nations so that they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God, we live and we move and we find our being. And as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. See, why I think Paul got converted here is what Paul ends up doing even at the end of his sermon in the Areopagus, right? So he says this, what Paul is doing right here, and this is what I, one of the reasons I love the Bible. We, people talk about the Bible and you've got to take it literally and it is the word of God infused. And it's, do you know that the, that the, that the poems of, of Greek philosophers and poets are contained uh, within our Bible? So in God we live and move and have our being. Was Paul just pulled that, you know, from... Epimenides, it was a, a Greek poem from 600 B.C. And then he ends his whole sermon with another poem from the phenomena of Eratus, we are his offspring. Paul is taking their gods, taking their poetry, and saying, you're already doing it. You already recognize this thing. God is at work in your life. And rather than being dismissive towards that, Paul weaves that into the gospel. Friends, people are going to church People are having theological conversations. People are having discussions about life and death and eternity and morality. And friends, I hope that as Christians, we would open our eyes and be converted like Paul was so that we can be invited into those conversations and we can add our take, our understanding of the revelation of God and Jesus Christ for us. Because friends, what a rich discussion that would be. Amen?